Welcome everyone to this incredible summit where we are gathering together in Sacred Circle to honor and reclaim the wild woman, the wise woman, the elder woman that we are. And I'm Alison Palmer. I've brought this together. I've brought us all together. I am the coordinator. And today I am super thrilled because I'm speaking with Mary Reynolds Thompson. Now, I just want to say a quick hello to you, Mary, before I introduce you properly. Hello, Alison. <laughs> so you can read Mary's bio underneath here, and I strongly recommend you do because then you'll read all the juicy stuff that she's been doing, all the work she's been bringing to the world and um, what she's bringing to the table today. So make sure you read that just to say a few words about her now. She is the founder of Live Your Wild Soul Story. She's an award-winning author. She's got a book coming out soon as well. So keep your eyes out for that. She's the facilitator of poetry therapy, which sounds amazing. And she's also a pioneer in the emerging field of spiritual ecology. And we're talking about something today, which is so exciting. And it's something that I was just telling Mary that I really feel I need, which is rewilding our elder years. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I wanted to start actually, Mary, with asking you, you know, <laughs> why were you called to, to bring this topic to the table? I mean, for me, it's amazing. But I wonder what was going on for you. Well, <laughs> I am in my elder years, um, so that's certainly something. But I think there's an immense opportunity for women of a certain age. You know, so much of our lives in our early lives are trying to build up, earning a living, raising a family, doing all these things, extremely important. And it's not like we stop doing all that. But there is something, I think, deeply liberating about living beyond our menopausal years. There is something in women, I don't know what it is, but having sort of focused so much of the first half of our life on pleasing others, there's this sense of reclaiming and liberating something very deep and authentic within ourselves. It's like we don't give a hoot anymore. You know, and it's this wonderful thing where you can be out and about in the world and there'll be this, you'll, you'll listen in on conversations and these old women are just spouting these like truths, you know, it's just like that. And so there's something about a sort of elemental quality of getting into our deepest, deepest essence of who we are. We shed so much of the persona, so much of the false notion of what it is to be a, a, a woman, to be desirable, to be all of these things. And we're just ready to reclaim our most authentic selves. Um, and so, you know, older women rock it. I mean, they really do. And we have a capacity as a group en masse to affect enormous change. So I think there's a great responsibility here too. Mm. Yes. Do you remember that that um, old poem? I think it was that when I when I get old, I'm going to wear red and purple. Do yes. Yeah. I do. And in fact, there was a whole red hat movement, I believe, That's of right. women who would turn up protesting for protesting against wearing their red hats. Yeah. Yes. And it seems like you know we have this, this possibility to be truly uh, liberational for ourselves at this point. What do you think it is that we need to, um, is, and I want to ask this, do you feel that there are sort of some depths that we have to go through, some parts of ourselves that are no longer, um, we, we choose not to take forward. Do you feel that's part of this process or, or is it not for you? It's deeply part of the process. And if I may, I'm, I'll just refer to the fact that a lot of my work is surrounded um, or surrounds these earth archetypes. And the very first one in this new book that, uh, that's coming out um, 
God, in two months' time, um, a wild soul woman is the desert woman archetype. So often women will say to me, you know, why are we headed to the desert first? You know, why have you thrown me into the desert? And one of the reasons that the desert is and desert woman is the archetype of that first initiation is precisely to do with what you're saying is we have to shed like the desert snake. We have to shed many skins in order to grow into our fullness. And if you think about the desert landscape, not only is it a wonderful mirror for our aging skins, at least mine, having spent too much time in California sunshine, but it is this sense of you cannot cross a desert laden down with burdens and luggage and stuff. I mean, you, you have to. It's not a landscape that can hold. So you have to travel light. And so, yes, I think death and rebirth are a huge part of any initiation. And in my work, the desert and desert woman really represents that aspect. Mm. That's that's a very powerful image, isn't it? Mm. And and I love how you you know related it to um, your skin because as I was feeling into what you were saying, I felt myself walking across hot my my desert was like sand dunes you know and my feet were burning because i shed even my clothes and i just had salt mm. crystals emerging on my skin yeah. and it was hot and oh and um yeah you're right i was carrying hardly anything and it can be really scary i mean when we're forced into that situation you know we do things don't we but it can be very hard to choose to actually go through that process and not run back into our familiar, you know, whatever it is, our baggage, whatever it is. How do we, how do we actually embrace that opportunity and make a choice that is true to us and really supports us and doesn't fill us with total terror because we're leaving so much behind? Well, <laughs> so that's a great question. And I don't know that any of us have a complete answer for that. But what I found is working with archetypes is that as you contemplate the archetype of desert woman and the landscape that is her realm, you begin to activate those places within you that can hold the terror. And in fact, it's very interesting because there is this word that we use to refer to the desert, desert, terra, actually meaning not terror, but land of nothing. And I think terra nullius. And so the sort of colonial powers that came to the desert and looked at it thought this, this is this complete, barren, lifeless, terrifying landscape. Now, when we're thinking of making change and leaving behind something, we are always going to be confronted to some extent with the concept of terra nullius, because where are we headed? We can't see it yet. We don't know it. It feels empty. But when we really begin to absorb the wisdom of desert is we realize that the desert is full of life. It's often hidden, it's often subtle, it's often underground, it's often divinely quirky and weird because the denizens of the desert have had to do extraordinary things to adapt to such a harsh and hostile landscape. But there is life there. And so as we begin to really embody that aspect of ourselves and a lot of the silence, the quiet. So I think one of the things is you have to be able to step in to that silence, to be with yourself. You know, this is a huge thing as women. We're off chattering here, we're off taking care here, we're nurturing there, to simply whoosh and be with ourselves. So, and to be with the terror and to know that it's there and it's okay because it's part of the process. It's not unnatural and by the way, we all know that answering the call is followed by refusing the call, 
So don't always expect, you know, we're not linear people. We don't march from one thing to the other. We may enter desert, completely feel like we've shed, and the next minute we're back to our old patterns and behaviors again going, oh, what did we do? It's okay, because you're bringing back to those old behaviors new insights, and those old behaviors are going to become intolerable. They are not, you know, if you, once you've shed a few skins, you don't get to hide as easily behind all the stuff that you've hidden behind. You know, so it's a process. It's a process. That was that was beautiful, and and it was quite astounding. Some of the things that um, you made me realize in that was that how much the um, colonial patriarchy has actually shaped how we look at um, at our own aging process, and that relationship of you know the desert being barren isn't that how we look at our elder years as being barren and you know shriveling up perhaps and um also the the concept of that linear progression um I, i'm so thankful for you to you for bringing that up because we're so programmed to think in a linear fashion because it's been the dominant way and yet when we can just relinquish that as you so wonderfully reminded us it gives us so much freedom and it resettles us into something that feels much more natural and authentic to us absolutely it does absolutely it does and i love what you say you know about this idea that there is this patriarchal expectation of women that we be lush and fertile and constantly fruitful and giving. And every woman of a certain age knows what it is to be invisible, <laughs> to lose that visibility. And it, it can be um, devastating, especially if if physical beauty has been a very powerful thing for you in, in the world, it's, it's been one of your superpowers is that you've had that kind of impact. That, that, um, and so there is this wonderful um, kind of deviant, um, shrewish, can't give an F <laughs> about desert woman that doesn't care that she's invisible because what she knows is that if you can't see what she's up to, she can be up to an awful lot. And so it, it's that thing. And of course, once you, I think patriarchy fears, oh, it fears all of the archetypes, forest, woman, ocean, for different reasons, but it fears desert woman precisely because we've stopped trying to please it. We don't care. You think I'm invisible? You know, you're worried about me wobblies under my armpits. I'm not. You know, I don't care because I am about more important things than trying to look a certain way for you or to act a certain way for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when we move into these elder years, Elders, it sounds like you know we're all pretty ancient. But what what's become apparent to me during um, this summit is actually our elder years are is, is probably the longest section of our life because you know if we're talking about menopause onwards, say we live to ninety something, that could be forty years of our life. We could be even older, get even older than that. That is a long period. And so we change in that period as well. Um, and what was my question going to be? Oh yes, when we, because the changes, you know, this um, um, ability to, to embrace the desert archetype as you wonderfully have um, put it for us and, and to relinquish elements of the patriarchal hold on us, choose to relinquish them. We can do those things uh, younger and so what happens you know I'm, I'm assuming 
I'm assuming that I don't know, I might be completely wrong. Does the desert archetype, is that specifically tied to a specific age or is that something that women can do at any point? Absolutely at any point. I think it's any point when you are trying to separate from a system that is denying you your authenticity. So I think that that is what, because it is, any Shiro's journey begins with a separation from community and we have to separate because we have to know who we are apart from all those influences and for women particularly so because those influences have been so dominant in our lives. But I think you also strike on something that's really relevant to this conversation, which is in a sense, we're pioneers. Women weren't expected for, for years, most of us died, you know, for centuries, most of us died in childbirth. Um, we, we, wouldn't, we didn't even talk about menopause because most of us didn't even have the luxury of going through it. And if we did, we, we were dead, <laughs> you know, a few years afterwards. So in a sense, I think these conversations are emerging because we, what, we are making it up as we go along. You know, we don't, in our society, in other cultures, there are many ways that elderhood is held. But in our culture, it was you retired, you had a heart attack, and that was it. And I mean, and so we are really, in a way, it's one of the most exciting, untapped, energetic movement potentials is this elder woman energy. Um, and we don't know. So together, we have, have to make up what that path looks like, right? Yes. So rewilding, okay. I wonder if you have a particular understanding of what that means for you, because for me, it's like an invitation, not only to release things that are no longer relevant, but it's to connect to a quickening of my energy and to maybe be disruptive, maybe be totally unreasonable if I want to. But it's an invitation to go into a place that I, I'm utterly unfamiliar with, actually. So I wonder what it means specifically to you. And does it mean different things to different people? I'm sure it means different things to different people. I loved it because when you were talking, I had this sense of, you know, rewilding is going beyond the fences. It's going into that, you know, we, we've been told we can live here. This is our place. And we decide, no, no, actually, I'm looking over there and there's this amazing forest and there's these wild grasslands and I can hear this waterfall and I'm going to go there. Um, specifically for me, um, my concept of rewilding is when we own in the deepest part of our bodies and being that we are the earth in human form. And that means that we carry within us not only the 13.8 billion year history of the cosmos, but the four and a half billion year history of this earth. We literally carry oceans inside of us. We literally carry starlight. We are made of the same stuff as forests. Our DNA are remarkably close to trees. So when we own that we are the earth in human form, for me, what that's saying is I carry the imagination of the earth, the, the creativity, the psychology, the spirituality, the potential, the, the immensity. So at that point, when you're going, I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to say that, I'm like, yeah, you know, and if you can think that you have all of that within you, that your ancestor is both a star and a tree. Your ancestor is the ocean. When you know that in the depth of your being, this gives you immense courage to step over the picket fence and explore the wildness that's, that's possible within you and within this world. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most powerful thing I've heard. 
in a very, very long time, you know, mm -hmm. and I do hear a lot of powerful things, but that actually is just, mm, it just resonates so deeply at such an insanely deep level, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because it's true. It's true. Yeah. And how wonderful when we can connect to that, just to be able, just that connection, that internal connection just liberates us at that very moment. It does. Yes, it does. Yes. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So, so as we... Um, as we seize this invitation of rewilding ourselves, because I just need to say this first of all, because sometimes rewilding can feel like, you know, somebody who is dancing madly around the fire, you know, that kind of wildness with the yes. hair, you know, the, that, that power of, of woman dancing with the long hair and the energy and everything. Mm. And that's one aspect of it, but it can also be something that is really calm and just so centered. It can be anything really, because, but it's, if it's that deep connection to really who we are and where we come from, you know, like you say, we are the ocean, we are the stars, we are the cosmos, we are the trees, we are the earth, we are the rock. Um, that just gives it a whole other dimension to me. So um, absolutely, and I I think to your point that wildness has become synonymous in our culture with out of control, mm. and that's actually not true at all. Um, and one of the things that I think I love so much about working with you know earth metaphors and archetypes is that the acknowledgement that an ecosystem is as healthy as it is diverse. So if you don't have diversity with an ecosystem, it's very, very fragile. So if we don't have women who are deeply introverted and quiet and don't speak out a lot, and if we don't have women who are dancing around the fire with their hair you know, to the winds and their feet barely touching the ground, if we don't have that full spectrum, then we don't have a healthy ecological system of elder women. We need us all and we need to honor that each person brings their unique essence to it. And that's the point, you know. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Absolutely love that. So as we are, <laughs> this is what I was going to ask you actually. <laughs> Sorry. As we are, um, no, I got deviated. <laughs> um, as, we, as we move into this space and allow ourselves to rewild, hmm. Um, how does that affect our relationships, our communities, the world? It's such a great question because I do believe very deeply that we live in a time when our individual um, transformation has to be planetary. In other words, we can't just stop it ourselves. There has to be this ripple effect. So for me, I think, especially with the wild soul woman, it's we're about dismantling the patriarchy. Every woman who says you don't get to control this or say this, or this is my body, so you don't have any say over it. Thank you very much. Every woman who just essentially says, well, great, that's the patriarchy. You go do your thing, but guess what? We are gathering over here to reshape the map of the world. We together have new dreams, new visions. We are seeding and incubating new ways of being that often are very ancient ways of being, you know, because there again, it's not progress this way, which is a, another thing we stumble across in our modern mindset, but we are creating a vibrant, alive, nurturing, inclusive, diverse, dynamic, sustainable culture. And if you want to go on screaming and yelling over here, great, but we're not listening anymore. And I think there is this real potential that as women, simply we stop battling that, 
that's what I, I actually personally love about my book and the archetypes is, you know, we can spend a whole life energetically over there battling it. But let's turn over here and just create something so magnetically wonderful that they will come. Mm. Oh, that's so that's so refreshing because I hear so much, um, you know, the old thing of you have to go and change things from within. And and you just made me remember, oh yes, I really tried to do that. And all that happened was. I got so depressed and so felt so super squashed. And then I turned away and I just thought, oh, you know, I don't, I don't want to engage with that anymore. And I let it roll off me. Um, and I guess what it needs is for more and more of us to actually step into this owning of the possibilities of, of this new ecosystem, as you so beautifully expressed a new ecosystem of beingness and it doesn't have to so so tell me about um exclusion you know like what do people so i'm thinking okay across like if we're here and there's patriarchy over there and those people say okay i'm changing but you know they're not women and they're not they haven't rewilded into you know why rewilded elder women but they they are other people and they want to they say we don't want to do that anymore we want to come in here um how do we go about navigating that how how do we contribute to that so what i'm understanding you're saying is if there are people who are intrigued by what we're up to mm. and want to find out more mm. Let's say they're men. Fabulous. Let's let's have our brothers with us. Absolutely. All to me, what we're saying is there is this sort of archetype above it all of the wild feminine. And it is that authentic, inclusive, collaborative, uh, community-minded, all of that energy. And I think men are deeply hungry for that as well why I wrote a book called A Wild Soul Woman and Not A Wild Soul Human was that I think women have, to, we have to do our own work first because we have to be so emboldened, so connected to who we are that when this tent gets bigger and bigger as it will, we don't get swayed back into something that isn't authentic. So I think we have to do our own work first before this balance of the masculine the feminine and our connection to nature finds that really reciprocal beautiful um dynamism but but first let's do this so that we are these powerful fully expressed beings um, that can't be you know clear-cut again Yes. Yeah. But, oh, this is, this is so beautiful and so powerful. And I'm really getting this sense of the community of that coming together and witnessing and experiencing together and supporting each other and nourishing each other with this other awareness, with this deeper level awareness and with this great reverence for um, the differences of how we each of us are embodying and embracing the rewilding re potential. Yeah, so I would just say that if we begin with Desert Woman, the journey takes us through these different archetypes to emerge as Grassland Woman. And the Grassland Woman really does represent, which really all Shiro's journeys do, the return home to community. And there is in me a great belief that until we reweave ourselves back into community the work is not done you know it's easy to be enlightened on top of a mountaintop in a way but it's when we get down 
and the people who were there at the beginning of the journey and the system that was there at the beginning of the journey and all the people who say, oh, you're just woo-woo and, oh, you know, get on with it and so on and so forth. How do you maintain that rewilded aspect? And I do think as elder women, because oftentimes we're not quite as dependent on that outside thing, we have an opportunity to really mentor women into this yes you can be part of community but how do you and that includes domesticity and it includes laundry and it includes caring for the kids and it includes all the things that lives are made of and we need to honor that because it is the stuff of life but that doesn't mean that you can't be a rewilded woman you know you are just bringing a different sensibility to these things right you have sort of sacred medicine that you are carrying with you now to offer to community. Um, but the community is a part of it because if you have sacred medicine and no one to give it to, then your mission is unfulfilled, which brings us sort of full circle to that question of, you know, is it about making bigger change? You know, and bigger change can be in a very small community. It can be in your family. It can be in your village, in your neighborhood, you know. Mm. Yes, it can be in every relationship that we have. I say that again, Alison. It can be in every relationship that we have. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I'm looking forward to your book coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, um, but I, th I think this has just been beautiful and, you know, um, it's really, I feel it's really given us, I, what I'm getting, I have an image, okay, and what it is, is us as mentors, as wise elder women mentors, and we've got fat, <laughs> fat, um, wide, bare feet, okay, and they're kind of, shuffling and dancing along and we've got our hips swinging a little bit <laughs> and maybe our boobs are moving but we've got our clothes on and we're just you know really just being being gracious mentors in the world um really connected into what's really important so thank you so much for that mm, thank you for that beautiful image <laughs> So, Mary, I know that you've got something to offer to people. So would you like to speak about that a bit? Yes, I'd, I'd be delighted to. Thank you. So um, there'll be um, a free audio download of the first chapter of Desert Woman of the book, which I would um, love for you to um, access if you're interested. And if you do that, you might want to leave me your email so I can let you know when, if you like the book <laughs> if you like what you hear when the full when the full monty appears uh, mid-september so um yeah that's that's the offer fantastic well in fact because we're pre-recording this so it should be out by the time that this goes out so there you have it of course i had forgotten <laughs> but actually the link might well be on this page so take a look at the link <laughs> There you go. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Alison. A good reminder. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, I, I really want to thank you today, Mary, for coming along and talking about this and really um, giving us a beautiful and different way to consider the potential of rewilding because I hadn't considered it in the way that mm. you talked about it. And it just made so much sense mm. when you spoke it. Um, desert archetype beautiful just beautiful so resonate with it um so a massive thank you to you for sharing oh, with us thank today you. Mm. thank you and everyone um thank you for joining us and i hope you i hope you've enjoyed this as much as i have um you know don't forget the links are below so do follow up and uh, embrace your, your rewilding potential because, wow, as Mary said, you know, we 
we need more of us to be moving into this space. So, so let's do it. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.